Good morning. Welcome to North Shore Fellowship. We're so glad that you decided to worship with us this morning on Palm Sunday. We're celebrating the triumphal entry this morning. We're singing Hosanna, and we want you to sing along with us. Wave your palms, girls. Woo! We want you at home to wave your palms. If you don't have palm branches, just wave your palms and let's sing Hosanna. Gibson, 
and Martin. And so, Lord, as we gather, Father, we ask that you would bless our time as we worship you, Jesus.
so take my everything, my flesh and blood. I lay me down on the altar, altar. I am forever covered in your love. So let the rain go. Let the waters rise up, stand as the ocean roars. Good morning. A welcome to you all. Great to be with you on this Palm Sunday. I pray that you're all healthy, well supplied, and still smiling. We are going through some very strange times. Hey, I'd like to take you through some of the things that we have going on today and through the rest of the week. Right after this service, on our Zoom calls, we're going to have a fellowship time, chance to get together with the folks you can't get out to see anymore, and also our youth group will be meeting. This is for ages 11 and up, which is basically fifth grade through eighth grade. I want to remind you about our Wednesday Worship and the Word on Facebook Live at 7 p.m. This week we're going to feature a live Passover Seder. Pastor Raphael and Allie will gather us all around their table and it's pretty nice we're doing it this way because I don't think we'd all fit otherwise. We will send out an email and a post on how you can prepare so you'll have what you need to participate along. Please though, if you don't want to do that, you're more than welcome just to tune in and watch. Hey, we want to remind you that this is a great opportunity to invite your Jewish friends. The Seder is going to conclude with the celebration of the Lord's Supper, which we typically would have had on this Sunday, but obviously the schedule has changed a bit. Our small groups are still meeting, or at least some of them. Uh, the men's group is going to meet every Thursday at 7.30 p.m. on Zoom. And also having a Zoom call on Thursday is our marriage group. Now they're meeting this Thursday, and then they're going to meet every other Thursday after that. Well, with this being Holy Week on Friday, we will have a Good Friday service. It's going to be on Facebook Live at 7 p.m. And then on Sunday, Easter Resurrection Sunday. We're going to begin with our kids' church at 9.30 in the morning on their Zoom call. We'll have our pre-service prayer at 10 a.m. on Zoom, of course. Uh, then we'll have our Easter Resurrection Sunday service, Facebook Live, at 10.30 a.m. Hey, if you're not getting these links or you need some help with them in any way, you have a prayer request, we're going to put up an email address for you right now. This is the one that you need to write down, and that's melissa at northshorenj.org. Melissa's done a terrific job during this time of separation to keep everybody informed and keep all the information going out. So if you need anything at all, you need the Zoom links or you want to get on the email list, just write to her and she'll take care of it for you. So, listen... Stay home as much as you possibly can. Be safe always, and above all else, do not be alone. Well, now I'd like to pray for our offering. As always, we encourage you to remain faithful in your tithes and offerings during this time. We believe that God will honor our faithfulness and continue to sustain us as a church, as families, and as individuals as we continue to trust him with our time, our health, and our finances. Join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you and we do say thank you. Even in these interesting times, even in the midst of trials, we thank you for the blessings that you have given and the promises that we have for the future. Father, we give you this offering and we ask that you would use it as you see fit. We ask that you would multiply it. We ask that you would apply it to your kingdom here on this earth and allow us to participate. 
give us this opportunity to give just a little bit of what you've given to us back to you. So, Father, we thank you, we praise you, and we love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Hey everyone, let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful, God, that we get to worship you together, no matter what is going on around us, Lord. You have made a way for us to connect with each other, and Lord, you have provided the way for us to be with you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we are just continuing to lift up this pandemic to you, God. We pray, Lord, that you would just protect us against this disease in Jesus' name. We pray, God, that you would just um, ease our fears and our anxieties as we're dealing with this. We're praying for the people on the front lines. Lord, please be with them, protect them. Lord, we are praying for the people that need to get out to work during this time. Lord, be with them, God. Lord, we're praying also for our sick. Lord, please just um, be with the, the ones who are sick with this and with other things. God, we pray also for the people that are stressed out with financial worries and families that need your peace. Lord, we are praying for them. Lord, we are praying for the ones that are struggling with loss right now. So many, Lord, we're praying, God, that you would just be with them, just shower them with your tender mercies, Lord. Give us strength, Lord. Give us healing. Help us to feel your, your blessings and your mercy, Lord. And Lord, give us joy as we're heading into Holy Week, Lord. We pray, God, that you would just um, help us to focus on things, knowing that you are near to us. Um, help us to follow your peace through this time. And Lord, help us to remember, Jesus, that you make all things new. Lord, we love you and we trust you. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Listen, if you need prayer for anything, please reach out to us. You can email us at prayer at northshorenj.org. Hey friends, welcome to North Shore Fellowship and thank you for joining us on this Palm Sunday. It's a fantastic time to celebrate Holy Week, the beginning of Holy Week. And we're going to do that by looking at the triumphal entry, which was what Palm Sunday is. Now, we've been in a series called Eyes on Jesus because we really believe that in any time, specifically tough times, the best thing that we can do is keep our eyes on Jesus. And we do that by looking to his word and particularly the Gospels. And we've done that so far by looking at the Gospel of Mark, four chapters of seeing what he did, what he said, how he reacted, and the things that he accomplished in his life, and how that impacts our lives today. Now, today is no different other than the fact that we're going to jump from Matthew, I'm sorry, Mark to Matthew. And we're going to hear what Matthew has to say about not just the triumphal entry, but prophecies being fulfilled leading up to the triumphal entry. You see, Jesus riding into town on a donkey was not just some random act. It was a fulfillment of a very significant messianic prophecy. And what are messianic prophecies? Messianic prophecies are things that Jesus had to accomplish, things he had to do, things he had to be in order to be considered the Holy One of Israel, the Messiah. And so while he was walking through his life and healing people and teaching and showing us the love of God, showing us the kingdom of God, step by step, day by day, he's fulfilling one messianic prophecy after another, after another, even before he was born. Now Matthew records 20 of them. I'll just want to show you a few of them. Matthew 22, I'm sorry, 1, 22 and 23 is when Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit in Mary, and that was a fulfillment of Isaiah 7, 14. Being born in Bethlehem, not just some random town, but he needed to be born in Bethlehem because Matthew 2, 5, and 6, it says Bethlehem in Judea. It's written, you, Bethlehem, the land of Judah, are by no means the least, for out of you will come a ruler. And this is fulfillment of Micah 5, 2. Fleeing Egypt during Herod's oppression of the children of Bethlehem. Fulfillment, Matthew 2.15, is a fulfillment of Hosea 11.1. 1. Being called a Nazarene. Sometimes that's debatable because it's, there's no scripture specifically that mentions Nazareth. But Matthew 2.23, we believe, is a fulfillment of Isaiah 11.1. 1. He'll be called a Nazarene from the branch, the Nazar. He preceded, uh, he, John the Baptist preceded him. Voice call in the wilderness, and that was Matthew 3, 1 and 3, a fulfillment of Isaiah 40, verse 3. Moving from Nazareth to Capernaum, you know, they were going to throw him off the cliff in Nazareth, and he moved to up to uh, Capernaum, up to the Galilee. Not just a random selection of a town to move to. It was a, Matthew 4, 13 through 16 was a fulfillment, you see, of Isaiah 9, 1 and 2. 
and then healing the sick and being followed by multitudes as we see in Matthew 8, Matthew 12, fulfillment of Isaiah 53 and Isaiah 42. Speaking in parables. Last week we talked about the parable of the sower. Jesus spoke in many parables. And we see in Matthew 13, 35, that Jesus says, these things to the crowd I spoke in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable, so was fulfilled by what was spoken through the prophet. And this is a, a, a psalmist. Psalm 78 verse 2 says, I will open my mouth in parables and all other, other things since, hidden since the creation of the world. Now, why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you all this because what we're about to look at is yet another fulfillment of a messianic prophecy. Another thing that verifies and proves that Jesus truly is and was the Messiah. Now, Jesus knew all these prophecies extremely well. Obviously, he is the Word of God. He knows the Word of God. He understood the Hebrew Scriptures. And he knew that he was the chosen one of God. So step by step, as he walked through life, as he fulfills one prophecy after another, he recognizes the journey that he's on. And the journey ends in suffering. He knows he will be, be tortured, betrayed, arrested, crucified. He also knows that he'll rise again. But as he's walking in his life in these three and a half years, he gets to this point where there's another prophecy that had yet to be fulfilled. And this was the prophecy, and it was a public one. It was one that requires a donkey, and it comes from Zechariah 9.9. It says, Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This is the prophecy that had yet to be fulfilled. It's different than the others because once he does this, once he gets on that donkey and rides into Jerusalem, it's somewhat of a death march. He knows it's going to put into place a chain of reactions that will rapidly lead to his arrest, his torture, and his crucifixion. And when he did that, the end would come quickly. Uh, the triumphal entry was not just a, some pleasant pony ride that we celebrate, not just the celebration of waving palm branches, although that's what happened. The triumphal entry was Jesus basically giving himself up and saying, yes, I am the one who was prophesied about. In the Old Testament, all these prophecies, and here I come to be presented to the people of Jerusalem and watch what happens. So we pick it up in Matthew 21, verses 1 through 9. It says this, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and once, at once you'll find a donkey there, tied there, with a colt by her. Untie them, bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them for them right away. This took place once again, Matthew is telling us, as he does 20 times, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Once again, this is Zechariah 9.9. So the disciples went and did as Jesus instructed. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them. And Jesus sat on the donkey. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed him shouted, very important what they shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Amazing. He who had been ridiculed, he who had been shunned, he who had been maligned, Jesus, as he traveled around, many followers, but many that deserted him, many that turned against him. The Pharisees and the Herodians uh, uh, strategizing on how they can kill him plotting a, a death to a sentence to kill him and here he is coming full on public down the the Kidron Valley into the eastern gate with crowds cheering Hosanna blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord a fantastic moment in the New Testament now this story takes place in all four gospels Matthew 21 Mark 11 Luke 19 John 12 but different angles, you know, the synoptic gospels and John have different angles to what they see in this event. So Matthew and John mention the Zechariah 9-9 verse, uh, the other stone. All but Luke mentioned branches, and John is the one that actually mentions palm branches. 
Matthew and Luke include some admonishment from the Pharisees and and this reply by Jesus, which is somewhat comical, and we'll get to that. So it starts out, this, this donkey ride, this procession, starts out in Bethpage and Bethany, these two towns that are located together uh, on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. So if you're ever in Jerusalem, and some of you have been, you, you always go to that one site. It's an elevated site where you clearly see the whole city of Jerusalem, the eastern gate, the old city wall, the Dome of the Rock behind the wall. Very popular view. And you've probably been there. If you've been to Jerusalem, it's where everyone takes their pictures. It's, it's kind of halfway up the hill. If you go all the way up that hill to the other side, down that slope, there's the, what were the towns of Bethany and Bethpage. And that's where this started. So Jesus came over that hill through the, uh, the Mount of Olives, through the Garden of Gethsemane, all the way down the Kidron Valley and into the Eastern Gate. And while he's doing that, the crowds are cheering. And they're, they're yelling, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Now remember, it's not just a random pony ride. This is Jesus fulfilling what, to, what Matthew says took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Jesus knew what this meant. The people knew what this meant. The Pharisees knew what this meant. It wasn't just a random act. So for Jesus to do this, he was either extremely audacious or he's the Messiah. You see, either he's an imposter trying to represent something that he's not, or he's the Son of God. Because no one would do this thing that everyone knows is a fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9, a messianic prophecy, unless they really truly believed that they were, verified was exactly who everyone was waiting for. They were waiting for the Messiah. The crowds that went ahead of him, Matthew 21.9 says, those ahead of him shouted, Hosanna, son of God, son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This word, Hosanna, shows up almost entirely uh, on Palm Sunday you, you, in, in not many other places. So we hear Hosanna, shout it. It's kind of the catch word, the catch phrase. A lot of our worship songs for Palm Sunday, for triumphal entry. What does it mean? Now, there's a lot of misconceptions on what it means. It's not another name necessarily for God. It's not Jesus' nickname. Actually, what it means, it means save us. It's not really a name. It's not even a praise, but it's a cry for help. It's a cry. It's from the Hebrew words yasha and ana. It's combined hoshana or yasha or hosanna. We say hosanna in English. And it basically means I beg you to save us. Please deliver us. It's a cry for help. But then it's followed by these words. Remember them. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So please save us, help us, deliver us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now that phrase, that's somewhat of a praise phrase. That's something that you wouldn't bestow upon anyone except the one whom you've been waiting for to deliver you, the Messiah. You see, all four Gospels represent different renditions of what they said and how they said it. And if you, if you sort of add them up and then paraphrase it, basically the crowd was saying unanimously, save us, our Messiah, who comes to fulfill God's mission. Save us, we beseech you. Take your rightful place on the throne and extend heaven's salvation to us. This is a monumental statement from the crowd in Jerusalem. It was a cry for help. It was a recognition of who he is, but it's also a worship, a worship. The most fantastic worship service, I'd say, that ever happened on planet Earth. (laughs) Why? Because Jesus was standing or riding right in the middle of it. Jesus was there. Similar to the one when David brought the Ark of the Covenant from the... uh, house of Obed-Edom in 2 Samuel 6, and he's dancing with his, you know, his, uh, his underwear on, dancing with all his might before the Lord, a processional bringing the ark up. This was better than that. Crowds were cheering Jesus as he enters Jerusalem, and they're sa- saying the things that everyone knows what they mean. They mean that he is the Messiah, that he can save them. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Wow. Everyone was excited except the Pharisees and the chief priests and the leaders. The Pharisees were infuriated. They knew what was going on. 
they saw his immense popularity. They couldn't touch it. So they said in Luke 19, 39 and 40, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. <laughs> if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. So once again, he's demonstrating his authority over them, his authority over the natural world. He already showed that he has authority over wind and waves. He has authority over gravity and flotation, sickness, disease, mortality, life and death. He has authority. He could have commanded the stones to cry out if he kept those crowds silent. And sometimes I kind of wish he did. <laughs> I wish he did. I wish, wish he said, hey, Kate, all right, all right, all right shh, 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 let's just keep quiet. And then we would have heard the stones. I don't know where, maybe the stones of the temple, the stones in the streets would cry out, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Can you imagine what that would have been like? Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we look at this phrase and there's so much in it. We've already told you that Hoshiana or Hosanna means Lord save us, Lord save us. But this other one, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In Hebrew, it's Baruch Haba B'Shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord is basically a well-known welcome to the Messiah, whomever he will be. This is the way we will welcome him. And when he comes, we will say to him, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, they didn't make it up. It's once again taken from an Old Testament scripture, this time Psalm 118. They're quoting it almost verbatim. Psalm 118, 25 and 26 says, Lord, save us, or Hosanna, or Hosanna, Hosanna. Grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. You see, this is a cry for help, but also it's a recognition welcome of the Messiah. And it's also a worship to him. And Jesus knew that. He knew what they were saying and he didn't reject it. He didn't leave them and go off into obscurity. He knew that his time had come. This is a significant moment in his journey. It's gonna, he's gonna enter the most significant uh, experience of the natural world that anyone's ever experienced. And that's the cross and the resurrection in just less than a week. So Jesus received it from the adoring crowds and he traveled down the Mount of Olives through the Kidron Valley into the Eastern Gate. And, and they were all crying out and shouting and cheering because they believed that the King Messiah was coming. See, their version of Messiah wasn't someone that would die on a cross and save their sins and, and, and you know, go off and come back thousands of years later. They thought there was going to be someone that was going to come and kick out the Roman Empire, reestablish the throne of David, and make Israel the most powerful nation in the world. That's who they thought Jesus may be. Now, they were later disappointed by that. Uh, so while they're cheering and they're screaming out and crying out and, 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 and praising him, there's others inside Jerusalem that are rejecting him. The chief priests, the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, the, the Herodians, the Pharisees are rejecting him. Instead of Jesus getting mad at them for rejecting him, something happens and he shows his heart in a way that's very tender. And it happens in his lament over Jerusalem. I imagine he went to a solitary place realizing that he's been rejected by the very ones that needed to accept him. And here's what he says. This is a lament. This is a warning. And this is a prophecy in Matthew 22, 37 through 39. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I've longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. And then listen to what he says. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You will not see me again until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. See, Jesus was once again predicting that he will return. 
And when he does, he expects to hear from all the world, particularly in Jerusalem, Baruch Hava Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that will be the day that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's when he returns. This week I've gotten a lot of calls and texts and emails and conversations. People asking me, Raphael, do you think this is the end? Is it, does this mark the, the very end of times? And I'm not talking about, you know, people that are just obsessed with it and are always crazy about it. I'm talking about people I would, would not have expected to ask me that question. And uh, my answer usually is the same. And I usually say, well, Matthew 24, 36 says, no man knows the day or the hour. However, I want to tell you, there will be a time when Jesus comes back. And I believe we're closer to that day than we ever were in history. I believe that the earth is bringing forth birth pangs and there are signs in the earth and the heavens and things that are showing us that the time is, is approaching. And I believe that he will come back someday and take us with him. And when that day comes, we'll leave our mortal bodies and, and we'll be like him. We will be like him. And Paul says, you know, now we only see in part, we understand in part, but then we'll know, as he knows, face to face. And I believe that when we know things clearly, when we see things as the way they're supposed to be and the way uh, the, the, the truth has been revealed to us, we're going to see things that are going to blow us away. And one of the things that we're going to see is the progression that we're, was leading up to those last days. And we'll probably look at each other and say, ha, yeah, we should have known. We should have known. You know, we, probably, we should have seen it coming. The rise of godlessness, the increase of knowledge, things having to do with Israel, wickedness, selfishness, natural disasters, pestilence, disease, ISIS, the coronavirus. We should have seen it coming. You see, I believe that Jesus is going to come back and we're closer than we ever were before. Will it be today? I don't know. Will it be next week, next year, next decade? I don't know. But I do know that it'll surprise us all when he comes. It's not our job to wonder and ponder and try to figure it out and do math with Bible verses. Our job is to occupy until he comes. What does that mean? Is do the things he's told us to do. Go and preach the gospel. Make disciples of every nation. That's what we are to be about. That's what we are to be about. Lastly, I just want to say this. I think about the donkey in this story. The donkey, sometimes overlooked. Sometimes he's sort of like a sideline in the Trump triumphal entry. We forget about the donkey, but he probably is, or she, the most significant donkey that's ever lived. Most important donkey, doing the most important thing that, that he was created for. And all he did was lift up Jesus and carry Jesus to a place where people could experience him. He brought them to a place, brought Jesus to a place where people could cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna. They, brought, they could cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I want to tell you something. That's our job as well. In these days, our first and foremost job is to bring Jesus to people that desperately need him. They desperately need to cry out for help and they desperately need to get to a place where they can worship him with all that is within us, within them. Jesus promises this in John 12, 32. If I be lifted up on the earth, I'll draw all people unto myself. You know, people are desperate, desperate for Jesus. They need hope, they need comfort, they need assurance, they need healing, they need salvation that can only come from Jesus. People need Jesus in their life, whether they admit it or not, whether they know it or not. But you and I are given a job, and our job is to bring Jesus to them, just like the donkey brought Jesus to the people of Jerusalem. And that's what we're to do as individuals. That's what I want to do as a church. I want to be a church that brings, people that, brings Jesus to people that desperately needs him. And what does that look like in your life? What does that look like in your job? What does that look like in these times? in your family, in your neighborhood, in your community, in your sphere of influence. You know what it might look like? It's just reaching out to people, texting, emailing. There's not a lot of door-to-door -door visiting going on, but you can, yes, make a phone call. They still work for talking. <laughs> you can reach out to people who are suffering, 
suffering anxiety, suffering in lack of assurance, suffering in deep insecurity, suffering from illness, suffering from those that are affected by the virus or loved ones or those who have lost loved ones and are grieving. You have exactly what they need. They need Jesus and they need you and I to bring them, bring him to them in our homes, in our schools, in our towns, our communities, our neighborhoods, our jobs, the most important thing that you can do. In fact, the only thing that you can do of eternal significance is to lift up Jesus. And you, if you do this during this crisis and beyond, until we go to him or he comes to us, you'll be lifting up Jesus as we just read John 12, 32. If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me, all people unto myself. So what do I ask you to do? In these times, pray, seek the Lord, understand the times that we're in, but understand your role in these times, and that is to lift up Jesus and watch what happens. He'll draw all people to himself through you. God bless you.
Thank you for joining us today at North Shore Fellowship. I hope you have a wonderful and meaningful week ahead. And remember to take time to focus on what's important, your health and your family, but most importantly, your relationship with God. And remember, you're not alone. We are here for you. We're here with you. And most of all, God is with you at all times. So never forget that. But if we can pray with you about anything, don't hesitate to reach out. Anything that's going on in your life, on your heart, please reach out to us. And if you've never given your life to Jesus and made him your Lord and your Savior, we'd be honored to lead you in a prayer of salvation. All you need to do is reach out to us in any way that you can. We'd be glad to respond to that. God bless you. Have a fantastic Palm Sunday and enjoy the Lord today.